Hello, this is EKG Recognition and Understanding for Nursing Students. This lecture is brought to you by Professor Lewis Kaplan of Simmons College in accordance as well with Justin Hooks, nursing student and critical care paramedic and ACLS instructor. Within this lecture, we're going to identify electrical pathology or physiology of the heart. We're going to learn how to correctly place leads for telemetry, including three leads and five leads. We're also going to learn about 12 lead EKGs. Most importantly, we're going to understand and recognize how to count the rate for an EKG strip, identify the portents, um, portions of an EKG in relationship to the cardiac cycle, and recognize most common ECG abnormalities. So action potential in the heart is the creation and transport of electrical activity throughout the heart muscle. Within the heart muscle, we have myocardial cells um, that are usually pacemaker sites, which we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period in relationship to EKG tracings. So this is your common EKG tracing that you will see here, the P wave, the Q, and the R, and the S, as well as the T. And so the P wave, to think to, you, uh, think to yourself, is going to represent the sinal atrial node, which is the first pacemaker of the heart. And that is um, an indicated of a positive deflection of the P wave right here. So if a rhythm has a P wave, it, it will um, be indicative of a sinus rhythm, as you probably heard that before. The next um, site that we have is the AV node, and then after that, the Purkinje fibers. As the electrical impulse travels from here to here, down to here, you see deflections, positive deflections on the EKG tracings, just indicate the closure and of the action potential within there. So we're going to start off with talking about the electrical pathways of the heart. So is the best way to describe it is if you're familiar with uh, baseball. In baseball, you have three strikes until you're out. And so um, within the heart, you actually get three strikes until you're out as well. And so the first pacemaker of the heart located in the very um, uppermost portion will be your sinal atrial node, um, considered the SA node. This pacemaker is your number one pacemaker of the heart, and that will stimulate a electrical impulse for the heart to contract and go down the pathway between 60 and 100 beats per minute. The next one after that, say if there's any disease process or this SA node is faulty, a good example that I like to use is if there is a myocardial infarction within the top portion of the atria and this SA node gets burnt out, rest assured, there is a backup. And so you had one strike. Your second strike is going to be the AV node, atrial ventricular, because it's right within that area of the atrial ventricular border. This will stimulate an electrical impulse between 40 and 60 beats per minute. And say, for example, your heart attack that you had that was right up here, that now has gone through an extended to the portion of the atria and is now moving down towards the ventricle and that other site is burnt out or any other disease process happens, becomes faulty, you have your Purkinje fibers and they are your third strike and final strike and they will simulate an electrical impulse or um, a beat of the heart between 15 to um, 40 beats per minute. Some textbooks will say 20 to 40. So the SA node is the number one node. It is the intrinsic rate of the heart. It will beat between 60 and 100 beats per minute. When we talk about tachycardia and bradycardia, it's in a relationship to the baseline rhythm. So a heart rate that we're gonna talk about is sinus tachycardia. We're also gonna talk about sinus bradycardia. So it's important that you know the normal limits of each of the the nodes because for example sino um, a sinus rhythm if it was sinus tachycardia that is by clinical definition a sinus rhythm that is greater than 100 beats per minute on the opposite side if a rhythm is sinus bradycardia by definition in clinical presentation that will have a p wave and it will have um, 
a heart rate or um, that you count less than 60 beats per minute. So you can have tachycardias, you can have atrial tachycardia, for example. So atrial tachycardia will be the normal is 40 to 60 beats per minute. So if a, um, a rhythm that is an atrial rhythm is greater than 60 beats per minute, say 70, for example, that would be considered by definition tachycardia. So it's really important that you understand and recognize what is the normal beats per minute in a rhythm. The AV node is your second strike, and so that will be between 40 and 60 beats per minute. Rhythms that are AV or um, that come from or atrial of nature that we consider are usually um, EKGs that have an absent P wave or an inverted P wave, so a flipped P wave. And lastly, your third strike, and third strike only, is your Purkinje fibers, which you have the bundle branch blocks, which we are going to talk about the bundle branch block. I'm just going to highlight what it is. Um, but you have your Purkinje fibers right here that will stimulate electrical impulse um, between either 15 or 20 to 40 beats per minute. So when it comes to monitoring the heart there are two different things in nursing um, that we do the first one is a 12 lead 12 lead is a one-time snapshot of the heart's electrical activity a 12 lead has um, 12 views but only 10 electrodes it's kind of confusing but it has more views so we're going to talk more about that when we get into 12 leads but um, it will give you a clear definition. How a 12 lead works is it will do, and it will make more sense when I show you an example, it will take three seconds, three seconds, three seconds, and three seconds at a time. So from start to finish, when the technician or the nurse takes a 12 lead, they will push start, it will go for 12 seconds and take a snapshot in different views of the heart over 12 seconds. And when it comes to telemetry, telemetry is continuous. However, it does not show a complete 360 degree view of the heart. Um, the good thing that we do have with telemetry is most of the times they do have a uh, data that is stored. So you can go look back in time, especially if someone is having what we call runs of ventricular tachycardia. That is uh, something that we can go back on a continuous telemetry that the patient wears and we can see we can also print out and telemetry is something that is um, occurring um, continuously. And so this is what, if you want to see how your patient's doing, if they're not saying they're not feeling well, that they feel very faint, you can look at the telemetry monitor and actually look at their heart rate and um, see this, the tracing. So with the 12 lead EKG and the EKGs, um, with 12 lead EKG lead placement, um, when we talk about lead placements, you will hear precordial leads and you will hear um, chest leads, the same thing used interchangeably, or you also hear limb leads. So limb leads, as they are defined, go on the limbs. A lot of people try to put limb leads on the chest, however, that is not where they are supposed to be. The importance of when we talk about lead placement is a big deal because where you place your leads can give a different deflection and so typically just like any electrical activity when we place leads on the chest or stickers <clears throat> we are going from a negative to a positive deflection so typically we like to look at lead 2 because lead 2 goes from the right arm all the way down to the left um, leg and so that is directly involved right in the center of the chest. Lead three is more of a um, superior view. Lead one is from the right arm all the way to the left arm. So it's kind of a lateral view that we have. AVR, AVL, and AVS, F, what these leads are, what the A stands for is augmented vector right, augmented vector left, and um, augmented vector front. And so you will see that they have AVF leads, it would make more sense when we talk about 12 leads, 
And then when it comes to the V leads, so the precordial leads, these are going to be leads that are placed on the anterior portion of the chest to try to give different views of the heart. So 12 lead, like I said, uh, we will talk more about this in the later lecture. What we are looking for in this is, this is three seconds of time, three seconds of time here, three seconds of time here, three seconds of time here. So this whole picture is not taking all, is not taken all at one snapshot. It occurs over time at three seconds, three seconds, three seconds, and three seconds. The result is what we are looking for. Um, we'll get more into detail, but we're looking at for classical findings of ST elevation and ST depression. <clears throat> so telemetry lead placement, you, like I said earlier, you have limb leads and limb leads are just that. They are specifically indicated for the right arm, which is your white lead, your left arm, which is your black lead, and then your left lower, which is your red lead, and your right lower is your green lead. People like to use the thing over smoke, over fire, and so um, they will use something like that. For me, that never worked out, so I just know that white, black, red, green. If you have, if you're very fortunate, most of the time they're listed R-A, L-A, L-L, RL. So this is your Ford lead that we have. Um, other leads, a six lead or a five lead, is going to be your right arm, left arm, left lower, right lower. They do a modified chest lead, which we call V1 position, which is the fourth intercostal space. And sometimes we may monitor for V6, which is a, another lead that we're placed right in. Um, towards the center of the nipple posteriorly. So when we're looking at a telemetry tracing, what we're looking at is a six second strip. A six second strip is a good snapshot and a good baseline to start. It gives us a lot of information. So typically when you do print out any EKG, you're gonna see some hash marks notice at the very top right here. And so what these hash marks are, they are indicating to you between this distance and this distance that this is a three second interval. So when you're looking at an EKG strip, you actually wanna have two, three hash marks. So you wanna have three seconds there, three seconds before. And so when we're looking at an EKG, we're gonna identify different things that we're gonna go over in the next couple of slides that will help us take a um, view of what's going on in the heart. To identify the rate, what we're going to do is count what we call the R waves. And so you're just going to count and you're going to multiply it since it's a six second strip and you want to do it per minute. So it's going to be counting the number of R waves and timesing it by 10. So you're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this rhythm right here is 80. Hard to see. So when we're looking at in EKG, there's a couple steps that we want to go through. First thing that we want to do is count the rate. We want to see if there a P wave for every QRS complex. As I said before, P waves are indicative and a classic that tells you that it is originating from the sinus um, node or the SA node. And so you want to see that there's P waves there. The next thing that you're going to do is look and see, count the rate. We're gonna see how fast it is. We wanna look at the rhythm, whether it's regular or irregular. So that involves us actually mapping it out. So we're actually gonna to have to do some tracings to do that. We're gonna see if everything returns to baseline. If there's the QRS complex, is the QRS complex with the normal limits? Is it wide or is it big? That's kind of important too. And how are our intervals? Is our PR interval within normal limits? It should be between um, 0.12 to 0.20. Is our QRS complex between 0.08 and 0.12? If it's a deviation of any of those, then we get into different types of rhythms that we name or diagnose. There's other ways that you can um, do. You can count a 300 um, 
using the 300 rule, what you're basically doing is counting how many big boxes are in between each R wave. So it'd be 300. Um, if it's one box after that, it's 150. If it's after that, it's 170, I think 65. Um, so it goes in that way. The 300 rate, just like even doing the um, six times uh, counting the boxes of six second strip it's not the most accurate but it's just a, a typical guess to get us there so the first thing that we want to do is we want to look and see count our rate see what our rate is our rate is going to be a clear indicator of telling us whether it's too fast too slow or just about right so when it comes down to evaluating the rhythm which is the next uh, spot the best thing that you can do, especially if you're beginning to this, is literally map everything out. You can print out another strip right here, and what you want to do is actually mark on the paper from, I typically what I do is I use the border of the paper if I tear, if I torn off a piece of EKG tracing, I'll do that and I'll measure from here to here, and I'll look at that distance, and then what I do is I'll take that and I will go and measure the next distances to see if they pretty much map, match up. So when, it, when we talk about whether a rhythm is regular versus irregular, means whether the distance between this R wave and that R wave is consistent amongst the rhythm, or does it vary? And so if you have any variances of it, then we're gonna talk about rhythms such as atrial fibrillation, and we're going to talk about rhythms such as a pr premature atrial contraction as well as a premature ventricular contraction, which you're going to see some irregularities between the R waves. The next thing we're going to do too is we're going to look and see is there P waves there, um, taking a piece of paper, going through, looking at it, marking your R waves, seeing the distance between. Like I said, it's not a good practice just to go and say, eyeball this and say, oh yeah, that looks about right. That looks about right. That looks about right. Yeah, it's not a good practice because you, you can be fooled by how um, it may be subtle, but there will be some differences. And this person couldn't have what we call a complete heart block and you can completely miss it. So we're going to look at P waves, and we're going to look at a, something what we call a PR interval. So keep in mind, for demonstration purposes, I will give the, the warning. This is a blown up image, and so our intervals are going to be off on this one. So what we're looking for is P waves. We're looking the P wave that's present is significant, saying that it is firing from the sinoatrial node. It would go down, so your P wave is your first deflection here. Now, something that a lot of people get confused with is the QRS complex. So your Q wave is going to be your first negative deflection. It may not be as pronounced as this. Sometimes it may not even be present, but your Q wave is going to be your first negative deflection. Your R wave is going to be this positive deflection, and your S wave is going to be this deflection and then you're going to return to baseline with some ventricular repolarization. So what the P wave is indicative of is the firing of the sinoatrial node. It's saying that there is a signal pathway that is going through the atria. So if you take this P, you take this P wave right here, if you were to draw an A, if you can kind of see that, draw an A, that is originating from the atria. Now the next thing that we have is the QRS complex, the depolarization of that. If you look at this, this is an upside down V. So this is your ventricular depolarization. So upside down V, ventricular depolarization. And then you have ventricular repolarization. And a lot of people will ask, where is the atrial repolarization? Because we have atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, then we have ventricular repolarization, but where are the atrial repolarized? And the answer is, is that this atrial repolarization occurs during this QRS complex. So you're not going to see any um, signal 
that is going to be indicative of that. So a normal PR interval, and we're measuring from the start of the P wave all the way to the end of the P wave. Like I said, this is not a good picture to do that. It should be between three boxes and four boxes. Just for review, and if you do not know this already, each one of these small boxes is 0 0.04 seconds. So each of these little boxes is 0 0.04 seconds. So one big box of an EKG tracing, okay, one big box right here is 0 0.20. So these small boxes right here is 0 0.04. So we're looking at the PR interval. I'm knowing, going to start here. I'm going to end here because my Q wave is here, my um, R wave is here, my S wave is here, and T wave is here. So we're going to start at the beginning of the upslope and we're going to stop right where it starts to go down. So that is our PR interval. So on this person, I'm going to count one, two, three, it's right about 0.16 or 0.12. It's really hard since these are not matching up in the right as I want to be, but this is going to be a normal PR interval. So you can see that there. QRS complex is going to be your ventricular depolarization. As I said, it should be between 0.4 to 0.12. Typically, it's around 0 0.08. Depends on how fast the rhythm is. If a rhythm is fast or we have a tachycardic rhythm, you will see um, QRS complexes at 0 0.04. If it's within normal limits, you will usually see a QRS complex of 0 0.08. So if you have a sinus rhythm between 60 and 100 beats per minute, you'll see a QRS complex of 0 0.08. QT interval is very important because that is a distance between this um, Q wave, the downward deflection, and to the end of the T wave. A QT interval is a combination of the ventricular depolarization and repolarization. And what we need to do as far as monitoring that is there are medications that we can give that do prolong that even in uh, females with antibiotics as well can cause QT interval prolongation. And so the problem that we worry about with QT interval prolongation is that um, this decrease, this amount of spacing is getting too much for us. The ventricles are getting too much, and so we can have uh, aberrant conduction such as ventricular tachycardia, um, really bad rhythms that can come out of it. The next thing that we're going to do after that is evaluate, go back and look at your P waves, make sure after we did all of our measurements, we're going to make sure the P wave for every QRS, QRS complex, T waves, so forth. We're going to look at the ST complex, uh, ST segment, see if it's elevated, if it's at normal limits. Uh, that, if you're looking at a telemetry strip where you're only seeing one lead, if there's ST elevation, that's not a clear definition, but just so that you know, ST segment elevation is associated with myocardial infarction. So that's why we do worry about it. T waves can be elevated. If it, a T wave is high, this is something condition called hyperkalemia. If the T waves are low, this is associated with hypokalemia. So we can see electrolyte deficiencies related to the different waves as well. So clinically, we're going to look at the ST waves. Um, we're going to see how they are. I'm going to talk more in detail as we get through. Um, like I said, T waves can be indicative of um, hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. U waves can also be a sign of hypokalemia, but it also can be an indicative of hypothermia as well that we look for. So. The isoelectric line is different. So what isoelectric line is you're going to be your baseline. So we measure all of our waves from the isoelectric line. So if you were to take these waves and draw a line all the way through the bottom, just where they would basically touch, that's going to be our isoelectric line. So it's going to be right at the P wave. We're going to draw this right here. 
draw this right here. What our isoelectric line is what we measure from baseline. So we can measure ST elevation from that isoelectric line. We can have P waves that are elevated, which is normal, or we can have P waves that are inverted below the isoelectric line, which is going to tell us something else is going on. Same thing in the case of T waves where they are elevated or they could actually be inverted, which will tell us hyper hypokalemia. So now we get into the good part. We're going to talk about the first rhythm, which is the sinus rhythm. So a sinus rhythm, what we're looking for, we're going to do a couple of things. So we want to identify a rhythm first. We want to see if this rhythm, uh, what the rate is. So the rate of the rhythm for a sinus rhythm is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. That is an impulse that's originating from the SA node that's traveling to the AV node and the Purkinje fibers and doing the contractions that way. Sinus rhythms are always indicative and present when a P wave is present. Like I said, we can make an A. So if we make an A right here, that would be our atrial rhythm. So it's present. So not an atrial rhythm, but it's present with the SA node that's originating from the top part of that atria. So we're going to look and see if it's um, what the rate is. We're going to count that out on a six second strip. It should be between 60 and 100 beats per minute. The next thing that we're going to do after that is we're going to map out the distance between this R wave and that R wave. We're going to measure that, mark that, then we're going to follow it with our paper, see how the other complexes are, and seeing if they're regular. So we're going to identify it that way. So all intervals are typically normal with a normal sinus rhythm, and our rate is between 60 and 100. We have our Q, we have our R, and we have our S. And we have a T wave. So P wave, Q, R, S, T. P wave, Q wave, R, S, T. So I have P waves present at QRS complex within normal limits. My rate, we're going to say that it's within normal limits. Keep in mind this is only a three second strip, so this rhythm right here would be 60. So it's within normal limits for sinus rhythm. So my Final answer is going to be normal sinus rhythm. When it comes down to talking about a sinus bradycardic rhythm, sinus bradycardic rhythm is going to be a rhythm that has P waves, okay? However, the heart rate is going to be less than 60 beats per minute. Don't be confused that if it's less than 60 beats per minute, that is an AV rhythm, because it's not we still have P waves present. If the SA node was not firing, we will not have P waves present. So P waves present and indicative absolute sinus rhythm. Typically, a sinus bradycardia can be less than 60. Most people, when you sleep, your heart rate does go not down. We see in deep sleep that the heart rate will go um, down a lot. If you're working a night shift, which you will see, you'll be able to tell exactly when someone's having a good REM sleep period or even someone has, um, they're in a, like a scary dream or anything like that. We will see the heart rate that will spike and then deviations from that. So typically the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. It will have P waves present, and this is a normal finding, typically in people that are athletes that do a lot of cardiovascular um, exercise. The one thing that this would not be a good thing to see if it was a bradycardic rhythm, if people have the hypothyroidism, if you have an intracranial hemorrhage where you have elevated intracranial pressure, you will see that um, it's pushing on the brainstem the cerebellum that's controlling the heart rate will herniate and the person will get bradycardic. That's never a good sign. So you want to look at your, not only are we looking at the EKG tracing, but we're also looking at our patient. So keep in mind as we're looking at EKG rhythms here, it's really important to know that this is only indicating electrical activity. This is not correlating any mechanical capture. How you identify mechanical capture is feeling for a pulse. So 
at the top of every R wave is where you should be able to feel a pulse. So if I was looking at the monitor and I was feeling for a radio pulse, each time I see this QRS complex will be when I should feel for a pulse. So this is an electrical, um, this is an electrical um, picture of the heart. It's not indicating any whatsoever when we look at EKGs, any mechanical capture. So as uh, people's heart rates go low, cardiac output also goes low too. Cardiac output is related to heart rate times stroke volume. So if our heart rate does go down, our stroke volume and um, will also change and our cardiac output will diminish. If the patient is symptomatic, one thing that we will do for them, we can try some atropine um, for them. However, it depends on the clinical presentation and what is actually going on. This person was having a heart attack and they, I gave something um, such as atropine to them, I could, in essence, um, kill them because I could make the heart work more and extend the infarction. A sinus tachycardic rhythm is a, rate, a rhythm that has a P wave still. However, the rate is above 100 beats per minute. So you see some P waves right here is a P wave. Right here is our P wave. We have P waves for every QRS. So we're gonna start with identifying. We have um, P waves with QRS. Let's just count the the rate. I'm just going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 120 beats per minute right here. So it's definitely over my 100. I'm gonna map from each R wave, see the distance, okay? So even though it's a tachycardic rhythm, the distance should remain the same if it's consistent. So we're gonna look at whether it's um, there, we're gonna look at our P waves, we're gonna look in and see that every P wave has a QRS and a T wave. Typically with a, like I said before, the faster the rhythm is, the QRS complex will get lower, so this is, or smaller, so this is 0 0.08 right here for our distance. Things that happen with sinus tachycardia, your exercise, your hypotension, as your blood pressure drops, your heart rate goes up to, and increase pain does this fever is a common indication for it as well as hypoglycemia so when someone has a sinus tachycardia um, just look at their baseline presentation see if what is normal for them you can even have hyperthyroidism where they could have a sinus tachycardia too so understand the underlying cause of what is going on with these patients the next thing that we have is premature beats Premature beats are different. Uh, so you will have a sinus atrial rhythm or sinus rhythm that it comes from the SA node. But uh, what happens is there might be a little spot of the top of the heart that gets a little sensitive and says, you know what, I want to have my fun too and I want to beat. And so what will happen is it will, the SA node will beat and it says, I'm going to beat my drum too. I'm going to beat my drum. I want to beat my drum. And so what happens is we have a what we call a premature complex. And we call it premature because if we were to measure between this R wave, that R wave, that's going to be the same. But we look and that is a little premature. It's a little beat shorter than what it should be, which should be if we mapped it out, it should be right here. So we look at this. Whenever I'm analyzing EKGs, what I like to do is when I see these premature beats, I'll just circle them. So I know, I'll circle them, that something doesn't look right on the EKG. Then I'll go back and figure out, was this a, was this maybe an atrial fibrillation? Is this a PAC premature beat? What is it? And so I know that this is a normal sinus rhythm because I have a P wave right here. Like I said, you can make your A that is coming out of the atria. You, I have my QRS complex, which is kind of small, to be honest with you, because this rhythm is a little fast. And so there's CP wave with every QRS complex, and we have these premature beats. What's going to tell me that it's a premature atrial contraction is the fact, like I said earlier, with a P wave, you make an A right here, and this is going to be a premature 
atrial a contraction. So we have the P waves. Typically, I will tell you, if it was a premature beat, what you're going to see is this P wave looks very much like that P wave, like that way. You're, the P waves are going to be present, but it's not going to be uniform to the rest of the beat because, like I said, it wants to beat its own drum, so it's going to beat a different drum that's going to beat at a different tone that's going to look different when you see it or hear it. So typically, PACs are normal. They do occur usually with um, caffeine ingestion, but I will tell you anytime you're seeing premature beats, what you should think to yourself is, is this po patient hypoxic or is there a spot in that um, each of the top portion of the heart that is basically not getting oxygen. So it should be of concern to you. So next we go to atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is where the heart is having a seizure. So typically you have a sinus SA node impulse that goes to the AV node that goes to the bundle of his, the right and left bundle branches and Purkinje fibers. And what you have is, so SA node is one spot beating. Now with atrial fibrillation, this node is trying to trying to beat but you know what there's other spots there's too many people at this party and so what happens when there's too many people at the party you're just a little bit at past your comfort zone you have these abnormal um, impulses that arise from different parts of the atria and they just beat and they beat and they beat and they whoever basically can get that beat strong enough that it goes through the AV node and through the Purkinje fibers will get this impulse. And so what you see with atrial fibrillation, we're gonna see different P waves because it's from different parts of the atrias and it's not going to be regular. So this can be a um, subtle thing is where someone just basically wakes up and says, oh my gosh, am I, I just feel like I can't catch my breath and feel like my heart's kind of skipping a beat. Well, when it comes to this as atrial fibrillation, it's really important to know and get a baseline in as far as the nursing assessment is when did this start? When did you start to notice this? Because we can do things if it's um, an atrial fibrillation, if it's within you know 24 hours, we can actually convert it. So we can do a cardioversion where we'll put the pads on someone, do a synchronized shock and try to shock the atrias and kind of slap that. Just the best example I, I can say is when someone's in atrial fibrillation, it's where you have these kids that are acting out. And I can tell you what, when I was a kid, if I acted out, uh, what my parents would do is they would slap me. And so um, basically what we're doing, the atrials are acting up. And so what we do is we put some pads on someone. If it's within 24 hours, we'll do a cardioversion slap them and restore the normal electrical impulse. If it's more than 24 hours or someone says, I do not know when this atrial fibrillation started, what we get worried about is since the atria is basically quivering right here, when it's quivering, we see blood clot formation that can have because we do not have blood that's flowing normally. So we worry about blood pooling in this area and it makes us very concerned. So the next thing that we will try to do is instead of using cardioversion, we're gonna to try to use medication such as calcium channel blockers to um, get these impulses firing the way that they should. So most commonly that we use is cardism that we use to convert it. Um, anytime someone has atrial fibrillation, you're going to see, uh, it's gonna look like a lot of P waves, okay? The QRS complexes is going to be normal, but you're going to see a lot of P waves. And what these P waves are is related to the pathology and the pathophysiology where there are different impulses within the heart coming from different areas. So you're going to get different presentations of the P waves that are going to look different in relationship to each other. They're going to have no correlation. So with atrial fibrillation, we're going to see, is this rhythm going to be regular or irregular? And so this is going to be irregular, and we call this irregularly 
your regular because it's no correlation between the two. And so uh, atrial fibrillation, normal, we have a you know heart rate 60 to 100. If the if you may have heard of the term atrial fibrillation, AFib with RVR, what RVR stands for is rapid ventricular response. That is an atrial fib fibrillation rhythm that is over 100 beats per minute. And so that is AFib with RVR. We do worry about that because when someone has AFib with RVR, this is your most common complaints how we usually find atrial fibrillation is because someone says my heart's kind of beating fast, it's skipping a beat, I just don't feel right. And um, we'll do a 12 lead EKG, we'll see they're an AFib, we're going to put them on a telemetry and look at their heart and this kind of monitor them and we're going to see that it's over 100 beats per minute. When it's over 100 beats per minute, people can have atrial fibrillation that can go pretty fast and so as the heart rate increases our cardiac output is affected by that. And so it's a cascade of, of things. And so we worry about the blood clots, we worry about stroke, and we worry about um, cardiac output. So AFib with RVR is really disconcerting to us. Another thing too is you can have atrial fibrillation with SVR, slow ventricular response, and that's typically an AFib rhythm that's less than 60 beats per minute. Most of the time I can tell you atrial fibrillation rhythms are between 60 and 100 beats per minute. They're usually irregular. What you're going to see is on the cardiac monitor that it will say um, 62, and then it will say 82, then it will say 70, it will say 90. The heart rate is going to vary. Also, as you're feeling for a pulse, when someone's heart rate is irregular, then that should tie in that, uh-oh, they might have atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> so normal, SA node uh, for sinus rhythm, everything looks good. Atrial fibrillation, the atrias are having a freaking seizure, and they are just going crazy, and they're trying to fight for their impulse. One thing that I want to talk about too, not to get confused with atrial fibrillation, is something called atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is pretty much the same thing or same pathophysiology. However, it's um, consistently where the atrials are firing more than the ventricles are. So the heart's having a seizure. This is beating, then stimulates an impulse. This is beating, stimulates an impulse. This is beating, stimulates an impulse. It's like each person's got their firing squad and they're ready to go. With atrial flutter, what happens is you're going to have a foci of the atrials are just beating a lot faster. So atrial flutter, this is the coolest rhythm to me, is I think of flutter, they're waving to you, waving, waving, waving. Then you have an impulse. And so you're going to see the P waves, there are going to be more P waves to QRS complexes with atrial flutter. Typically, it it can be regular, and it usually is what we call, so if I were to diagnose this right here, this would be an atrial flutter rhythm with a 1, 2, 3 to 1 conduction, 1, 2, 3, 3 to 1 conduction, 1, 2, 3, 3 to 1 conduction, 1, 2, 3, 3 to 1 conduction. This right here, don't let it throw you off, this is a PAC. This is a PAC too premature beat, but this is an atrial flutter is where you see a sawtooth pattern right here. And so this is where the atrias are beating really fast. And then the ventricles are saying, you know what, I can't handle you. We're going to get, you know, I got to take a time out for a minute. So you can kind of beat and then I'm going to I'm going to contract when I want to contract. So every third impulse that you give me, I'm actually going to do something about it. So there is some variances that you're going to see. So atrial fibrillation, you're going to see a lot of P waves that are different. This is not a good one. P waves are going to be really different. Their rate's going to be irregularly irregular. What you have here is this is going to be pretty much regular, and you're going to have use a conduction of a 3 to 1, 2 to 1, 4 to 1. Depends on how fast it is. So now, if your brain is overwhelmed, don't worry. Put this on pause come back to it, we're going to talk about heart blocks. So if you paused it and you're just returning back, welcome back. If you stuck through it, congratulations. We're going to try to hammer the rest of this through. So first degree heart block 
we're going to show some pictures of is a PR interval greater than 0 0.20. So it's really simple. If our PR interval is greater than 0 0.20, that is what we call a AV block. And so when we talk about heart blocks, we're talking about the signal between the atrias and the, ventric uh, the ventricles. There is usually a disconnect. There's a slowness to it or we're, we kind of get a drop of it, or we talk about a third degree heart block, there's no association between the two. So first degree heart block is gonna be a PR interval between 0 0.20, that's where your SA node is gonna fire, and then it's gonna take a little pause for a minute, and then it's gonna go to the AV node and then go to the rest of the Purkinje fibers and then make a contraction. So you're gonna have a little firing, and then I'll pause, and then it's finally gonna get to the AV node. With a second degree type 1, we're going to give some examples, but the second degree type 1 is called a winky bock. And so it's where the PR interval gets longer, 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 then we have a drop in a QRS complex. A type 2 heart, um, so a secondary type 2, we call this a Mobitz 2. This is where the PR interval remains the same and everything looks good, and then all of a sudden we just drop a QRS complex. Like, what the heck happened? Like, what's I don't know. Something happened with that. So we do see that. Third degree heart block is where we have P waves and we have QRX complexes, but they have no association with each other at all. You will maybe see no P waves because they're hidden in the QRX complexes. Another thing that is indicative of these third degree heart blocks is that their QRX complexes are going to be wide. They're going to be wide because the atria are trying to fire and then there's a disconnect and then we have the curious complex that says I need a beat and so when it beats it's going to be a ventricular rhythm and so it's usually a wider complex and so how we treat these or what we call high degree blocks is usually with electrical therapy atropine will not work on these patients because there's a disassociation between the two and what happens with atropine or any um like epinephrine, what we're going to end up doing is stimulating the atria and you're going to cause so much trouble that you don't want to do. So not a good thing. So let's talk about a first degree AV block. And these are really cool. When you get into practice, you start measuring them out and you find a first degree AV block for the first time. It's like, wow, so cool. And then you tell the um, your colleagues and then they say, you say, hey, that person has a first degree AV block. And they're like, okay, what do you want me to do about it? Because pathologically, we're not going to do too much about it. Like I said, it's where the SA node is firing. And it says, I'm going to fire. And I'm going to take a little break. And then that impulse goes to the QRS complex. So PR interval here, I'm measuring right here all the way to here so i have one big box if i do not have a p wave in that one big box we have a first degree av block so keep in mind as i'm looking at this first degree av block i'm doing my same thing i'm counting my rate i'm looking i'm measuring between this r wave and that r wave to see if the distance is consistent among the two seeing that i have a p wave for every qrs complex and then I'm going to go to my PR interval, then I'm going to go to my QRS interval, my QT interval. So in this complex, what we're doing is we're looking at the PR interval, and it's going to be longer than 0 0.20. So clinically, we really don't do anything about these. This is just something to kind of watch and know that there's a delay that's occurring that we should closely monitor and just this can turn into other degree blocks. So when it comes down to a first degree type one, I put here Mobitz two, but I'm gonna change that real quick to Winky Buck. I'm gonna call this, a, this is a Winky Buck. So you have, here's the way I describe this, and it usually typically works. So you have someone that you find super attractive and you're looking at them and they're walking down that street 
And so what you do is you look at him, you make eye contact, you wink at him. Yeah. And so then they get a little bit closer, they go past you, they turn around again, you wink at them. And then they get a little bit further away, you turn around again, you wink at them. And then the next thing you know it, you look back and they've turned the corner. They have gone. That's not good. You've lost them. So what happens with a second degree type 1 is your PR interval is going to get longer, 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 and it just says, no, right, I'm done wink, and you're not going to get my wink back. And so next thing you know, we don't have any conduction fully, and so the QRS complex just gets dropped. And then it starts to go back again. It gets longer, 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 and it drops. So your second degree type one is your winky bock. So it's winking, winking, winking drop. So hopefully that makes more sense with it. Your C PR interval longer, 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 fires, and they're not there, drops. Longer, 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 drops. Now when it comes time to talk about a second degree, type two heart block, we call it a Mobitz two. So what we will see within this presentation is the P waves are going to be within normal limits. What we're gonna see is just for some darn reason, we don't have any conduction to the QRS. It's like, what, what, I, you didn't, you didn't get my signal for a minute? That's a little weird. So the P waves are firing and then there's no conduction. Like it didn't even go through. It's just like, you know, you, you hope when you take an ATM machine and it says, how much money do you want to take out? It's just like you trying to put in a million dollars and it's like, it says, okay, it's being processed. But you look and you're like, Where's my million dollars coming out of the ATM machine? It doesn't happen. So what we see with our P waves and a second degree heart block, P waves are gonna be there. Our QRS complexes are gonna decide there. They're gonna work when they wanna work. So the impulse that may go, may not. So with the second degree type two heart block, the thing that we worry about clinically is that we're going to have, we have these mis QRS complexes. So we're like, where is the QRS complex? And keep in mind, with every QRS complex is a, um, in essence, your pulse. And so this rhythm right here is only 30 beats per minute. That's not good. And this one right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, sixty 60 beats per minute, that's all right. But, you know, when we start to get beside 60, less than 60, uh, we start worrying about cardiac output being affected. So, like I said, we're going to have P wave, PR intervals are going to be normal, going to be consistent. We just have a drop QRS complex. So there's a faulty signal that's not going to the ventricles to do that that um, contraction so that's not a good thing at all so with these we can try giving um, atropine i can tell you the american heart association guidelines are saying not to do that what we do with these people is we will put a pacemaker we will usually put an atrial and a ventricular pacemaker or um, we may just put a ventricular pacemaker because the atria is firing, but the ventricle is just not firing the right way. So we usually put a ventricular pacemaker that will help with the conduction. When it comes down to a complete heart block, this is a bad breakup between the atrias and the ventricles. I mean, this is a bad relationship that they end up having. So this can occur in people's younger part of life or they can have um, in later part of life where you just you know you give up you you know it's just like if you're married and <laughs> thought to yourself oh god I, I don't know how I can do this anymore um, if you, this feels like you want to give up and so when you have a complete heart block what we're gonna have we're gonna see there's P waves that are present there's Q waves 
and all our ways cure us complexes know how I said earlier usually your the telltale sign of this is your um, curious complex is going to be wide so when it comes to complete heart blocks usually will you will see a wider QRS because this is not a good thing the atriums are contracting and the ventricles are saying i not getting a signal i need to fire so how oh man i gotta do a contraction so anytime a a uh, heart is the main pacemaker where it's trying is always going to be wide so here you see p waves i put here p waves and i put where the curious complex should be and so you see here where the curious complex should be and they are just not there anymore you have no association between p waves and curious complexes and just keep in mind too typically we can see at times that p waves are caught up in this QRS complex too. So to discern whether this is a complete heart block versus anything else is we want to do a couple things. We want to look at our rate. Okay, we want to look if it's regular, irregular. We want to look at our PR interval. If our PR interval is some whacked out number. I can tell you this is probably a whacked out rhythm to begin with. So if our P waves are um, not associated to every curious complex, then we need to think, okay, we got a second degree heart block in here maybe, or we definitely got a third degree heart block. And so third degree heart blocks, you're going to see no association between P waves and curious complexes. And you're going to see usually the rate is going to be very low because the ventricles are not beating as much and they're intrinsically going to beat their normal rate so their normal rate as we talked about way back in the beginning of this was between 15 and 40 beats per minute so you're going to see here 40 beats per minute is this heart rate this is not good someone having a complete heart block we will do um, the only therapy is getting electrical therapy and we will do a pacemaker of the heart and we may externally pace this person um, while we get them up to the cath lab <clears throat> so you will see some other QRS abnormalities besides being a ventricular rhythm is you're going to see a right bundle branch block and you're going to see a left bundle branch block. I'm not going to get into much detail other than you recognizing what is right, what is left. Okay. So when it comes to a right bundle branch block, here's what I'm going to do. You're sitting in your car, you're driving. Okay. You got your nice car and you're wearing your seatbelt and you're driving and you're going to make a right hand turn. So as you're grabbing that steering wheel, what are you going to do with your turn signal? Are you going to put it upwards or are you going to put it downwards? So you're driving, you're going to make a right hand turn and you're going to turn your turn signal because you're a good citizen and you're going to flick your turn signal upwards to signal that you're going right so you're going to see this r prime r you're going to have a higher to the right okay it's very simple the only thing that we look at bundle branch blocks i'm going to tell you you cannot see a bundle branch block in a one rhythm strip the best way and the only way to definitively diagnose a um, bundle branch block is going to be on a 12 lead in lead v1 if you have a five lead here then if you can uh, augment the leads and get that ventricular lead modified chest lead then that is good and then you can do um, v1 so your ekg is going to go up okay to the right that's going to be a right bundle branch block now let's talk about our left bundle branch block and i like this picture a little bit better too so right bundle branch block you have your branches right here and you just have like it's it says, uh, I don't know, you got, it just burned off for some reason. Um, physiologically, this can be from a heart attack. Could be a heart attack on the septum right there that affected the right side. So you have, uh, it's uh, burnt out from it. The, it's not conducted this way. So uh, this kind of, this guy has to take most of the work. So with a left bundle branch block, okay, you're driving. Think to yourself, I'm driving, I'm driving driving definitely not driving in boston because they drive like crazy so you're driving and you need to make a left hand turn so what way you're going to turn your turn signal you're going to turn it 
down. So we're going to look at V1, okay? And we're going to look at the morphology is going to be down, okay? So left bundle branch block is going to be down. If you look at it anatomically, you're going to see a block that's going to occur right here, okay? So bundle branch blocks, significance of it is basically a disconnection there. Uh, what we do worry about the presence of uh, bundle branch blocks is in the heart attacks. If we have a um, new block formation and they have chest pain, that is kind of like, uh-oh, they're probably having something going on. So the next thing we're going to talk about is premature ventricular contractions. Uh, anytime you hear premature ventricular contractions, so say with PVC, PVCs are fun to look at on the EKG. They are cool, but I can tell you we have PACs, that, the premature atrial contraction that are originating at the top portion of the heart. Not really bad, okay, because it's just stimulated, but we still got two other strikes uh, before we're out. When we have PVCs or pre premature ventricular contractions, we get concerned. What we get concerned about is now the ventricles are getting thirsty. They're getting hungry for oxygen and there's an irritable focus in here. Typically, if we see a lot of PVCs, it, the first thing that you want to do is look at the person's baseline, see if they're having any hypoxic event. What we do is we look at, we monitor these PVCs. PVCs can be indicative of an abnormal focus that is going to be a wide QRS complex, okay? So it's a different beat that's premature, that comes where before it shouldn't have, and it's going to be a wider QRS complex. It's not going to look the same as a normal one. Okay, so you're going to see a wider QRS complex. PVCs can be unifocal or they can be multifocal for this presence. This, this presentation, this is very basic that we're just going over, but you can have PVCs in different focuses. This PVC right here looks the same as that one and that one, so what we would do by definition call this unifocal. Um, going on further, this PVC is occurring every second beat, so we would call this a bigeminy. If you, you might have heard of it before is that way, trigeminy every third beat. Um, and you may have heard the term as couplets. That is a couplet, there's two of them, so you can have two PVCs that occur together. Like I said, it's not good. When we see PVCs, one thing you wanna think about is, uh-oh, this person is gonna go into possibly VTAC, and so uh, your C runs a VTAC, so not really good, but, um, Sometimes people may have PVCs, and um, another thing too, since this is a ventricular contraction, okay, you may usually feel like an added heart rate with it. So if you are feeling for impulse and it's irregular, the one thing that you want to think about may is this atrial fibrillation, is this PACs or maybe PVCs. <clears throat> okay, now moving forward, we're going to talk about ventricular tachycardia. Okay, you have three strikes until you're out. You have your SA node, you have your AV node, then you have your Purkinje fibers that go down to the ventricles. And so when that overrides all of the other ones, we go into ventricular tachycardia or referred to as VTAC. VTAC is not something that's good. You can have a pulse with this, okay? This you can have a pulse with. So we have pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and then we have um, ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. So pulseless ventricular tachycardia, usually these patients are, well, I can tell you, these patients are unconscious, and this is where we would shock it. We would do electrical therapy if they're pulseless. If they're stable and have a, um, a pulse, then we're going to do medication therapy such as Amiodarone. Amiodarone is a, usually a first-line drug that the American Heart Association at this current time does recommend. We're due amiodarone 300 milligrams. We're going to push it over extended period of time of 10 minutes. So we're going to do an amiodarone, see if that converts them. Why do we like to use amiodarone? Amiodarone has a, a long half-life, so if we're able to convert this, 
we can take some time to start a drip and do some maintenance versus other drugs such as lidocaine. Lidocaine also has other body effects too. And so amiodarone is more specific to the ventricles. Lidocaine is basically you're numbing the heart. And so we're trying to numb it, put it down. So lidocaine you, does work. It's just not a first line thing that we would do. Um, so ventricular tachycardia, this is, you know, is a life-threatening event, whether it is um, pulseless or has a pulse. Uh, if it has a pulse, we just kind of sit back. We kind of try to be, you know, really concerned with them. But what we want to do is we will um, try to do medication therapy. Um, if they're unstable or they're pulseless, then we will be doing CPR on this person. And uh, since they are unconscious and their heart is not beating right, so the first thing we're going to do is CPR, CPR, CPR. We're going to prime the pump, prime the pump before we defend fibrillate it and slap it and say get back into normal and so we'll do that and hopefully that does work and restores the rhythm now the other thing is ventricular fibrillation this is where your ventricles are quivering so say that we have a heart attack that has extended burned out our av node burned out our sa node and now it's um getting very irritable in the ventricles and so the ventricles are having a seizure and just quivering. This is where no blood is um, flowing through the rest of the body. So you're gonna see these weird disorganized rhythms. So anytime you see this, double check your patient, make sure they're not brushing their teeth because they could be brushing their teeth, they could be itching for example, um, we've seen. So you see um, ventricular fibrillation. So uniform is a tachycardia ventricular fibrillation is kind of all over the place we have coarse and we have fine v-fib we're not going to go into details for this other than fibrillation is where the ventricles are quivering from the focus and it's not good at all so the first thing that we do to treat this is that we will do cpr 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 we're getting iv access we're going to um, prime the pump before we do any defibrillation. Uh, everyone is pretty much CPR certified. So when you are shocking someone with an AED, when it does say shock of eyes, so one thing that you're looking for <clears throat> now after going through this lecture is to identify that when the AED is going to shock the person, it is going to be because of a ventricular fibrillation is present. So ventricular fibrillation is when the heart is not getting enough oxygen, it is quivering, having a seizure, trying to get any blood flow to the rest of the body, but it's not going to be adequate enough. What does restore that is better medicine is what we call better medicine with Edison. Um, so better medicine with electricity. So we're going to do shocking using AD. But like I said before that, we since the heart is not beating effectively, we want to do CPR, restore um, the preload to the heart so that when we do shock it, it can pump with a full beat of blood with it. So um, typically with any dysrhythmias, what we do, we try to improve and identify the underlying problem, whether it's ischemia, heart failure, if it's a valve problem, so forth. We can do drugs that will um, do the rate and um, we do anticoagulation um, anti uh, for uh, atrial fibrillation. Pacemakers we put in for high degree secondary blocks such as second degree type two or um, complete heart blocks. Ablation is something that we do for atrial fibrillation where we have the different focuses that are trying to to beat so we will go in and burn that area of the heart is it successful sometimes it's really hard to identify where these cells are coming from because it's really small um, if someone has a history of VTAC or ventricular tachycardia what we will do is we will put a implanted defibrillator so they are called AICDs and so these are um, put in them 
if they have VTAC. Um, another thing too is if someone has congestive heart failure, just to let you know, um, if we worry about these rhythms such as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, they will go home with what we call a life vest, which is an external defibrillator since their heart is so weak putting in a regular defibrillator implanted is not the best thing. They won't survive. So what we would do is we will put a life vest on them that will, it's basically an external defibrillator and we'll shock them if they go into those rhythms. <clears throat> so real quickly, we're going to talk about unstable angina. We're going to talk about non-STEMI and STEMI. So um, stable angina is when we have occlusion um, that's usually just below 75 percent uh, because about 75 percent people actually have symptoms so your heart could be occluded stable angina is where someone is getting chest pain usually with exertion and what they do is they usually sit down take a break and then it goes away with rest or it goes away with the use of nitroglycerin sublingual and so as we do that we take nitroglycerin and it goes away, so that's good. When it becomes unstable is where we worry about where they've worked, uh, they've shoveled the snow like they shouldn't have, and what happens is they go and take their nitroglycerin, the pain doesn't go away. So they take a nit another nitroglycerin after five minutes, the pain still doesn't go away. Then they take another nitroglycerin and the pain still doesn't go away. Now we go from being a temporary occlusion that's relieved by vasodilation um, of the nitroglycerin to not, and so we do get concerned with that. So that's unstable. And these people are admitted and they're continued on IV nitroglycerin. Non-STEMI is a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. This is typically where someone is having a heart attack or may have had a heart attack, but it's not fully present right now. It's not fully there. Uh, it's just a partial vessel occlusion. We're going to see things such as CKMB and troponin markers that are going to be elevated in these patients. And then lastly, we're going to have STMI, so ST elevated myocardial infarction. Uh, we're going to go through and show you where this is. This is a complete occlusion, which is an emergency. So um, what we see with the differences, I just talked about these. Um, what we're looking for in any sort of um, heart attack, we're looking at ST changes. So how the morphology goes is think to yourself uh, like a floor of a of a house. You have your basement. Uh, so I have a two-story house with a basement, okay? Two-story house with a basement. So if I start at the very low level, so ST depression is going to be my injury. <clears throat> excuse me, not injury, it's going to be my ischemia, downstairs ischemia, okay, so downward, um, downstairs lower level is going to be my ischemia, it's going to go down, then the pathway occurs as I'm coming up to the stairs, I'm going to go to injury, and as I go all the way up to the upstairs, it's going to be infarct. So think of yourself as being in a house that is in the summertime, as you're in a house in the summertime and there's no air conditioning, okay? So as you go to the basement, it's going to be colder. So we have some um, ischemia going on. And now you're going to go to the main floor. It's pretty hot in there. You're going to start to sweat, okay? So you have some injury going on after that. And now you're going to go all the way to the top floor and it's going to be hot as all can be and so now you're going to have massive sweating and it's going to be very uncomfortable so that is kind of the pathophysiology that in the clinical presentations that you're probably going to see with these patients that are having an st elevated mi they may have some slight diaphoresis and it's going to get really progressive as we have the changes that are going on so criteria for uh, considering whether we have someone having a uh, ST elevated in MI, we have to look at the isoelectric line and we have to see if there's um, depression elevation. So we see if there's 
ischemia, injury, infarct. So obviously ischemia is concerning not so much of a priority as injury and infarct because that's presence. We're going to talk about looking at ST elevation in two contiguous, EK, two contiguous leads. So when you have a 12 lead, so you're going to see some couple things of the 12 lead. You're going to see three seconds here, three seconds here, three seconds here, and three seconds here. So when you have um, EKG, it's going to be three seconds snapshot, three seconds snapshot, three seconds snapshot, three seconds snapshot. The very bottom of every 12 lead is um, some of them. It's default to that printer and that 12 lead device uh, manufacturer. You may have what we call lead two, or it may be defined as that hospital is putting V1 in here because that's the most direct view of your heart. So what you want to say to yourself is when you're looking at this 12 lead, we're looking at ST elevation in two or more continuous leads. If I have ST elevation, just one lead and not the other one that's associated with it, we cannot qualify by definition that is actually a um, heart attack. Same thing if you're giving narcotics and you have to waste it, you can't waste it on your own. You have to have two people. So same thing with that. So we're going to talk about heart attacks. You want to say to yourself, I see all leads. So we're going to look at leads two, three, AVF. These are your inferior leads. So I see V1, V2, septal leads, V1, V2, septal leads, V3, V4, your anterior leads, V3, V4 anterior leads, and V5 and V6 are your lateral leads, and other lateral leads are going to be lead 1 and AVL, I think of L, L, right here is lateral. So here we go. Here's a regular EKG. You want to say to yourself, I see, I see all leads, okay? So we're going to look to ourself, I see all leads. Okay, so let's look at some ischemia going on. First thing that you have with ischemia, think about it in the very basement. That hot day is not too warm down there. It's bearable, but kind of a little uncomfortable. You're going to see ST depression. So ischemia goes down and then it goes injury infarct. So I'm going to show you some different presentations of that. So we're going to see ischemia going on here. And so I'm going to say to myself, I see all leads. Okay. I see all leads. So I have to have two contiguous leads. So I'm going to look at lead two, lead three. They don't, that doesn't look the same. Lead two, AVF. Is there some ST depression? Yeah. And it usually, keep it, and I forgot to say, it has to be two millimeters, okay, in length. So it's got to be two boxes, kind of big. So I see, okay, septal, don't see anything there. Okay, um, all, some depression here, maybe. Okay, but does this one match that one? No, it's a little progressed here. But I can't call it a, I can't call it an um, interior fully. And then I see lateral right here. Boy, this looks very much like that one. So we have a schema in the lateral portion of the heart. I'm going to confirm this by my other secondary backup lateral leads, which are leads AVL right here and one. So we have ST. Um, depression right here, ST depression, ischemia, ischemia. Then I have ST depression here, V5, V6, ischemia. So we have ischemia present in the lateral portion of the heart. Now we're going to talk about some injury patterns, okay? So we're still going to say to yourself, I inferior C all leads okay so we're going to look at this portion right here we're going to look at two three avf for our inferior portion i have st elevation right here okay not good so 
downward ischemia, elevation, injury, high up infarct, okay? So we have some injury going on right here in our inferior lead, the very bottom portion of the heart. Typically, we call this an RV infarct, the right ventricular infarct. These patients, you want to be very judicious with nitroglycerin because if we wipe out their preload, we just decrease their heart. Not good at all, okay? So we have injury going on our inferior leads, my anterior, my C septal and anterior and lateral leads, not too bad. I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to look at my AVL and my 1. And one thing that I'm going to see here is there is some ischemia going on in my lateral leads. You can see the depression. So what that is telling you clinically, there is a blockage that is a blood clot for sure in the inferior portion of the heart. And now it's progressing the level of blood, um, the level of hypoxemia is now affecting the lateral portions of the heart. Not good at all. Inferior wall MIs are really, really big. So another thing that we're gonna see, so we have ischemia, then we have injury, and now we have infarct. So infarct is going to be progressive of the ST segment that is going to be so elevated. So we're going to start off I see all leads. So I23 AVF it has to be in two leads. So we have two three AVF. I have three more than two. So that's good. Inferior wall MI for sure. Um, infarction going on. I'm going to look at V1 and V2. So these two are septal. Here's one thing that's interesting. I'm seeing a ST um, depression. So there's ischemia going on there, ischemia going on there, ischemia going on there. Okay, so V1, V2, these correspond with each other. So we have infarct and the 2, 3 AVF, the inferior leads, and now V1, V2. I have ischemia in the septal portion of the heart. V3 and V4 correspond with each other. V3 is ST depressed, however, V4 is not. So I cannot say by clinical definition and rules that they are also having a schema to the anterior portion of the heart. Lateral portion of the heart, not too bad. However, one thing that I do notice that brings up my attention, I do have some ST elevation here. However, has to be in two leads, two two confirmations so I don't see any elevation here then here I have some depression but I don't have any depression so what's going on here inferior wall am I with ischemia to the septal portion of the heart so that heart attack is going from the very bottom working its way up the septum of the heart so we talked about ischemia injury infarct some ST elevations um, ST depressions there is some practice ones that we have here, so we'll just go through it real quick. Um, tell me what you think. First thing that we're going to do, I see all leads. Two, three, AVF. What do you see? ST elevation that is profound, really profound. So we have definitely an infarction going on. Inferior portion of the heart. V1, V2, C, septal, don't see anything. Um, anterior, all, okay. You're going to see an elevated T wave, okay. Don't get this confused with this ST segment, okay. So this is indicative that there's something going on. It could be hyperkalemia that you're going to see this too. But you're not, with a heart attack, you're going to get a slurring. There's not a slurring or what we call a J point to identify. So no slurring present. We just have high peak T waves. So nothing going on in the septal portion. And the T waves still high. But I'm not seeing an ST segment being fully elevated. So um, the only thing for this one. Oh, keep in mind I forgot this. AVL and two. One AVL. So I have inferior wall MI with lateral ischemia. Okay. Inferior wall infarction with lateral ischemia because it's down. 
Okay, we're going to say to ourselves, I see all leads. Two, three, AVF, I, inferior. Am I looking for any ST elevation? Don't see any. Don't guess it either. V1, V2. V1, C, septal. Do I see anything here? No. V3, V4, anterior. Do I see anything here? Nope. Now I have V5 and V6. Yes, I have something. These do not look like normal. So we have um, ischemia injury going on in the lateral portion of the heart. Two contiguous leads, V5 and V6. So this heart attack, very subtle, but it's kind of big. It's the lateral portion of the heart. It can double check and see if there's other portions of the lateral portions of the heart. And no, so this is a good heart attack to reverse right here. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to, this is also a good one. We have two, three, AVF. So I, we're looking for ST elevation, okay? ST changes. I have ST depression here. Profound ST depression. Profound ST depression here too. So... That is ischemia going on in the inferior portion. Okay, I, C, septal. I really do not see that big of ST changes here. Anterior, no ST changes here. Lateral, no ST changes here. Now I go and look at my very final thing, my two lateral leads, my other ones. Now we have a big problem. This is what we call a fireman's hat, and this is not a good indication. So... These two correspond with each other. So final answer is lateral wall infarction or, um, or an injury that's going on with inferior wall ischemia. Okay, lateral um, infarction, two, three and AVF, three and AVF, ischemia going on. This is another good one that we're going to do. So, I, 2, 3, AVF, I, nothing there. Inferior, C, septal, V1 and V2, septal, C, V3, V4, anterior, nothing there. V5, V6, lateral. So, we're going to look. Ooh, we got some elevation on ST segment here. So, we're going to see this. And we're going to see that it's right here is elevated. So lateral portion, two contiguous leads. Now I'm going to go to my other lateral leads right here. One, an AVL. Now I have also positive indications. This is not a good sign right here. This is not a good sign here too. So which, what part of the heart's having a heart attack is the entire lateral portion of the heart is having a heart attack right now. Not a good thing. Uh, this is another practice one. This is your inferior wall MI right here with ischemia going on in the lateral leads. And I'm going to call this a lateral wall MI yet, but it's just about close. If this was a little bit up, I would say positive for lateral, but this is your inferior wall MI. Uh, this is a good EKG too. Just looking at it, see if you're good by now. Where's the heart attack at? This is your septal wall, am I? V1, V2. Your septal wall, am I? Where's the heart attack at? It's so hard, you can't really see a heart attack. We have some ST depression here, some ischemia going on, inferior leads. I can't call this, I, even though it looks really bad, I can't really call this a heart attack here because V3 has to be V4. One thing I'm going to point out, though, is there's something called left ventricular hypertrophy. This is where we have high voltage on our um, precordial leads right here, so in the lateral portion of the heart. So we will see high voltage where these QRS complexes come all the way down and they will touch the other ones. 
This is something called left ventricular hypertrophy. We see that in instances of hypertension. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of EKGs that we have different things. I'm just going to show you that. You can pause the video and try to practice with it. Same thing with this. You can pause the video, practice with it. Practice makes perfection. So uh, that is about it. I just wanted to point you, I'm going to give a shout out to um, this awesome web website by Skillstep. So I will uh, show you here. I'm going to put a link in the video. This is a EKG and it's continuous so you can actually go and stop it. And one thing that's really cool is it has a heart rate. And so you can go through and look at the different rhythms. It talks to you more about it. And you can stop it as soon as you put it. So um, that is basic EKG for nursing students and also paramedic students if you're getting into the field. Um, again, my name is Justin in partnership with Professor Lewis Kaplan, RN, MSN with Simmons College of Nursing. Take care.